everyone. Back to bed if you're in school and off to work if you're not. Um, thank you for coming. I want to welcome you this morning to Brew College Campus High School. My name is Alicia Perez Katz. I'm the principal, and I'm here with our assistant principal, Douglas Kaiser. And we're going to give you an overview of the school for about half an hour. And then you're going to get a chance to go up to visit our school, see our classrooms, talk to our teachers and our students. So you should have a piece of paper, a colored piece of paper that has the room numbers. And it's a self-guided tour, so um, I'll remind you at the end, but basically you're on your own. You can go up, explore, go into the rooms that are staffed with, they'll be marked with signs, some of our rooms, because this is a PD day. We have teachers that might just be planning. So we're going to focus on the rooms that are welcome with kids in there. They're going to talk to you, answer your questions on each subject and their experiences. And those are up on the fourth and fifth floor, and we have two staircases, one to the right, one to the left. And I'll go through that again at the end. But let's get into giving you an overview of the school, leaving a time for a few of your questions, and let's get started. So, Baruch College Campus High School, who are we? Uh, we are a District 2 honors level high school. We've been here since uh, 1997. We were founded as a partnership between Community School District 2 and Baruch College. We originally started in Baruch College, a few blocks away, um, and as the college grew in its reputation and we grew as a school, we now are Baruch College campus near the high school, other way around. It's too long. So we're still Baruch College campus high school. We're no longer on the campus. We're right next door. So the Baruch College library is actually on 25th Street, just down um, 3rd Avenue. So it's an easy walk from here. Our students also, we use the gym for pep rallies. We want to bring the whole school together at the college on 25th Street. And also we have um, some courses that our students take there, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, for myself, I've been at Baruch since a long time, since the third year it opened. I was a founding teacher here. I taught high school 11th grade English. I taught Spanish advisory. I was a newspaper advisor, go back in time. In 2003, I became the principal after also working as a staff developer and mentoring new teachers. And I've been the principal here ever since. So this is a school I've seen evolve over time. It's a school that's very close to me. We have, I think one of our strengths is we have consistency in staff. We have a range of, of teachers and staff members, a range of experience. We have a lot of folks who have stayed and invested in our school community. And they say when you invest in a school, it really pays off. So we think our sticking around has helped Baruch stay a good place. So as you can see how happy all of our Baruch students are, they're all smiling, they love it here. Um, and that is something that's really important to us. What you're gonna hear a lot about today is we're gonna talk about the importance of community. So while we are a rigorous school, while we focus on the academics, um, adolescence is a time when you know, identity and community can't be understated. It's such an important part. So we have a lot of structures in place um, where it's, whether it's you know, acknowledging our students' backgrounds, bringing them into our school culture, um, shaping our school from year to year. It looks different depending on who our students are um, and finding places for them to feel connected to their school and to each other. Our students, um, we have a focus on service, so every year they complete 20 hours of community service. Um, and also we have a senior exit project that all of our seniors complete. They do um, research, they look at making an impact on their community, and that's through their government class. And we actually have a partnership with an outside organization called WISE um, that helps them kind of identify issues in their community, and there's a citywide competition that they um, present in at the end of the year. So I'm going to talk about, I kind of uh, alluded to this before, our core values really ground our curriculum. So what is it the students are learning at Baruch? Here, teachers have a lot of creativity in crafting their curriculum. I think it really brings their passions into the classroom. But we have four core values that anchor how we teach and give consistency across the school so that the students also know what our expectations are. So we talk about rigor, community, real world connections, and global citizenship. Um, for rigor, I think you can't go to a school that doesn't say they're not rigorous. So how do we define rigor? I think for us, it's really that depth of thinking. Um, we talk about rigor in a couple ways, and Doug's going to talk about our coursework, but our students here, um, as we recognize we are a screen school, we look to put our students in advanced coursework in the upper grades. Um, that's one way we define rigor. We define rigor by also providing the appropriate support so that all students can access content depending on what type of learner you are. Um, so not just teaching in one way, but giving students opportunities for project-based learning, opportunities for group work and collaboration, 
Um, we're not an all or one or nothing school, but there are some tests, there are some projects. We really try to have a well-balanced um, learning environment so our students can show their strengths. In terms of community, um, you're going to hear more about our advisory program. I think that's really the heart of our community. Our advisors stay together for four years. Um, I'm an advisor, Mr. Kaiser's an advisor, so we model that as well. Um, and we really build relationships. The, the nice thing about advisory is that for the parents and families, you have one contact in the school, and we really get to know the students. I have a senior advisory now. I've been with them since they were freshmen. We're talking, I'm helping them with their college essays. Um, one, one of my advisees yesterday, he's interested in college that my brother went to, and he wants to study economics, and my brother works in economics, whatever that is, you know, banking. They're going to talk. So we're connecting and supporting students, and those relationships only happen through the consistency of community that exists in our advisory. Um, and then we talk about real world connections. As I alluded to before, learning has to be meaningful. Uh, you know, you always get the question, why am I learning this? Why does it matter? Um, sometimes easier to answer than others, but we try our best to try to make learning relevant at school. So one of the things, I'll give you an example, in 10th grade, all students do a year long of anchoring their learning in service. So we have actually an outside organization come in, they tell their life story, and they ask students to really identify um, what they want to take action on. They read different books of different backgrounds, and then students present projects. We've had everything from um, and it also connects in math. They do, is it Twitter or Instagram? Um, Instagram. Instagram. They actually post and they try to track the statistics of kind of getting their message out there. And we've had students talk about homelessness. We've had students um, look at human rights issues, gender inequality, um, different issues that are relevant to their lives that are anchored in text, that are anchored in content, but are relevant to the world today. And lastly, global citizenship. We value the backgrounds of our students, but we also know we're preparing our students for a global economy. So the more um, we're focused on looking out and looking in, um, we have partnerships with schools in Japan, New Zealand, we've had partnerships with Denmark before, where they come and visit us, um, and we have opportunities for collaboration. So then there's who is Baruch as a student. We say Baruchian, so who are you? So we have our three E's, we call them. There are school-wide beliefs. So our three E's are basically how we are in all of our classes. So that not every teacher is saying, okay, here are the rules for my classroom. You need to do this, 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 and this. But rather, this is what anchors what we say who we are in all of our classes. Um, and then students define that themselves. So you guys are in high school, so you have a lot of voice. Um, but we talk about empathetic, enthusiastic, and extraordinary. So empathetic, we really value uh, working together. There's a lot of collaboration at Baruch. There's a lot of group work. So how can you work with those who maybe you don't necessarily get along with off the bat or see eye to eye? How do you kind of understand maybe where they're coming from or try to put yourself in their shoes? Because we have to work with different kinds of people. And so we talk about developing the skill of empathy. Um, we're enthusiastic, so we come in, we're excited about our learning, we're ready to learn, we're prepared, we are um, bringing joy into the classroom, we're asking curiosity questions, um, we do a lot of discussion in classes as well. And then lastly, we're extraordinary. And the, three e, the third E, extraordinary, we purposefully did not select excellent. Um, excellent means you've got it all, you're perfect, it's done. Um, there's such uh, pressure we're finding more and more these days with young people um, to kind of get the everything lined up, get into the best high school, get into the best college, get into the best job. There's a lot of stress and how do we balance the realities we know our communities are facing with seeking our own self-improvement? Where are you? What are your goals? Where do you want to strive to be your best wherever that is or in whatever that is? So we're not all competing against one another. It's what we look to move away from. So I'm going to introduce Mr. Kaiser, and he's going to talk about the program. Hello there. My name is Douglas Kaiser. I've been at Baruch. This is my fifth year, second year as assistant principal. The previous three years, I was a special ed teacher and the leader of the special ed department. And I had, uh, before I came to Baruch, I was in middle school special ed teacher for about 12 years. Um, one of my responsibilities is programming, so I'll take you through the ninth grade program and talk to you a little bit about what the 10th and 11th and 12th grade programs will look like. So all our ninth graders come in and they start global literature. It's a two-year course that spans the globe and it spans genres, and it's not necessarily chronological. It, 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 it goes through all different time periods. 
It's a wonderful course where students are learning reading, writing, interpreting um, serious literature. Followed by that, we have Global History is another two-year course. It, it ends in a Regents at the end of 10th grade, but in 9th grade it starts with ancient civilizations the whole world over, and it goes to about the mid-18th century, you know, civilizations all around the globe. After that, we have uh, math. So the ninth graders, their math course is really going to depend on what math class they're taking now in eighth grade. If they're taking standard eighth grade common core math, from New York State, then they'll enter Algebra 1, the first Regents course. However, some eighth graders are taking Algebra 1 now. If they are successful and they pass the Regents, then they will go into Geometry for ninth grade. All our ninth graders take Biology, Living Environment as the first Regents Science class. Students take our foreign language is Spanish. That's the only foreign language we teach. Similarly to Math, depending on what your middle school experience was with Spanish, you'll take Spanish 1 or 2 based on your middle school transcript. We also have our own screening process on orientation day. So students who may not have taken Spanish one in eighth grade, but maybe they're a strong native speaker, they can pass, go through our screen and maybe be placed in Spanish two if our teachers think they're ready for it. Physical education is gym class and it's very important, it's twice a week. Then there's advisory and flex. Ms. Perez already spoke to you a little bit about advisory. Advisory means twice a week on Mondays and Fridays. On Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, during that same time, we have something called Flex. Flex is an opportunity for ninth graders to meet in smaller groups with a core teacher, English, social studies, math, or science, to either have enrichment, remediation, or maybe an interest um, lesson on something outside of the curriculum, but can connect to our school values in another way. So it's a really cool program. It, it rotates often, so students are shaking up different groups, different teachers, depending on what their needs or what their goals may be. And then finally, in ninth grade, all students take health. It's a New York State requirement. We do it in ninth grade. So that's the basic ninth grade schedule. Just some things to highlight in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. In 10th grade, all students take art. That's where we studio art all year long. That's where we fulfill the New York State requirement for art. And then there's, for students who are interested in art and think they might pursue it at the university level, there is an enrichment art class in 11th, and an elective art class, I should say, in 11th and 12th grade for those students who are serious about art and think they might pursue it further academically. And uh, in 11th grade, that's when we start to amp up the rigor with AP courses for all. In 11th and grade, all students take AP language as their standard English class. And all students take AP US history as their standard social studies class. So AP classes have a lot of rigor and a lot of expectations. Our 9th and 10th grade English and social studies classes are teaching the prerequisite skills to prepare our students for the AP classes in 11th grade. And then in 12th grade, student, all students take AP um, literature. This group will take AP literature in 12th grade. And then there's some more variety in 12th grade classes. That's where things get shaken up. There's a variety of math classes, including the college calculus class at Baruch College. So that's just a snapshot of our program. Art at BCCH is, we take very seriously. I already spoke about the 10th grade art requirement in the 11th and 12th grade electives. We try to bring more arts into the school any way possible. We have a theater group that works with our 9th and 10th grade class. In 9th grade, they work during Shakespeare unit and student, and that culminates in a Shakespeare production on this stage. And in 10th grade, they work in the poetry unit, which culminates in a poetry slam, um, which is an evening event on this stage. We also have outside music groups that come in and meet with our students on Tuesdays during flex periods, lunch and after school that students can sign up for. We have a relationship with Jazz at Lincoln Center where our students are going, sometimes they go to, to Jazz at Lincoln Center, sometimes they come here and they perform for our students. So we look for a lot of ways to bring arts into our school through outside organizations and teaching artists um, in, in many possible ways. Athletics, so we have a pretty robust PSAL department at Baruch. We have about 10 teams. We have our boys and girls soccer just were eliminated, but made it to the playoffs. Our girls volleyball is still in the playoffs. We also have wrestling in the winter, JV and varsity boys basketball, varsity girls basketball in the winter. In the spring, we have softball and baseball and fencing. And I might be missing something, but we have a pretty robust athletic department for a school that has less than 500 students. So if there's an athlete among you, there's a place for you.
here. And then back to community, we spoke about this before, but it's a major theme in our school. It often starts in advisory, where students first learn their advisory, and that's their first community, and then they learn their grade, and that's kind of how they become a parochian in ninth grade, through advisory. And then it, it goes and it grows and it grows, going from a parochian to a, a citizen of New York City, to a citizen of the, America, to a citizen of the world, and how we can take positive action for our world. And it's built into our advisory curriculums, it's built into our social studies curriculums, it's built into pretty much all our classes. So this is constant theme that, that we support and that's very dear to us. Uh, finally, oh no, not finally, I should say clubs. We have a lot of clubs. We have a club fair in the fall where office holders of those clubs will set up at tables in this room here and student ninth graders can go and check out all the different clubs and sign up for them. We have a lot of mainstream clubs that you can see pretty much in any high school in America, like Model UN and others. And then we also have a lot of student voice, student driven, student agency clubs. So if a student comes up with an idea and he's got a group of kids that's into it, and there's a staffer that has the time after school and willing to hang out with them, and we think it's a good cause and a good idea, then we are supportive of student driven clubs as well. So here are some of the things that we have going on and we're always open to new ideas. And finally, college. We send your students, your children to college. We're pretty good at that. Our record is 99 to 100% of our students go on to college, go on to university. And it's all ranges of universities from community college to the Ivy League, from international college to state college to, you know, to out of state college, public and private. Our students go everywhere. We have a college of office staffed by a full-time guidance counselor whose only job it is to support families and students with that process. And that work starts young. It starts in like ninth and 10th grade through advisory. And your child's advisor will also be a partner with you and your, and your child and the, and the college of office to support you in that process. And last but not least, talk to you a little bit about admissions, so I'll pass the Mike, back to Ms. Perez. Thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a very simple process in New York, it's just getting into high school. <laughs> um, so I know how crazy this is. So whatever we can do today to help you understand, um, to make the right choice for you and your child. And I, I say that because for each of you, it's an individual choice and decision. So I'm gonna talk about our parameters and then we'll have time for some questions as well. Um, before you head upstairs. So as I said when we started, we are a District 2 high school, so as in that, our priority for seats first go to students that are attending a District 2 middle school, public, private, or parochial, and or living in the district. So either of those qualifies you as a District 2. So all students who meet our criteria first get um, seats offered. If we don't fill our seats with District 2, we would then move to Manhattan, um, same things, schools, residents, and then if we didn't fill, we would move to the outer boroughs. So it really depends on how many applicants we have. Um, traditionally, um, just because of the nature of our school, we've stayed within the first priority, um, but I can't say that 100% because it really depends on the numbers of applicants each year. Um, after that, we have, we're very pr excited this year that we're a part of the diversity and admissions priority. Last year, our school leadership team met monthly with students, parents, um, and staff, and really talked about uh, what do we want our school, who do we want our school to be. And we talked about a lot of different pieces, and we um, landed in the diversity and admissions priority in really saying if we're a District 2 school, we really want to reflect the district as much as possible. So we have 35% uh, of students who meet our criteria, which I'm going to go into, um, will get priority seats first um, if they are free or reduced lunch. That reflects the percentage of current 8th graders in District 2. So that can vary from year to year. But for your cohort, um, that's, that's the priority. You meet our criteria, then the first 34% of seats um, go to students in free or reduced lunch. So let me show you the rubric, and this applies to all students. This is on our website as well. I know it's a little hard to see. I made it as big as I can. But you can go on the website. Um, it's all there under admissions. <laughs> Um, so for the first thing is we have what, so the district, I discussed then there's one screen. The first screen is our attendance screen. So all students must meet our attendance screen before we rank you on the rubric. So that means 10 absences or latenesses. 
either or both. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, it doesn't matter as long as you have 10 or less, um, we'll then look to rank you. Um, if you have extenuating circumstances, you were sick, you had a death in the family, etc., you need to talk to your middle school guidance counselor and they'll indicate that on your application and then that qualifies you as well. So, okay, so you've got nine absences, zero latenesses, you live in District 2, you're good to go. So let's take a look at how we rank our students. So you need an 85 or higher in English, Math, Science, and History, your four core subject areas from seventh grade. So any, anything from 80, 85 or above, we say that's the criteria we can, you can come to Brook. Um, also, the test scores is a three or four. If you have all of that, you get 10 points, you get a rank of one. Let's say you didn't have a good testing day and you got a level two in ELA, but you had a three in math and you have all the grades. You still, we do all the math, we add it up, you're still gonna get a ranking. You would then get a ranking of two. So again, depending on the number of students that we have as ones and how many come to our school. Um, so we're still ranking ones, twos, threes, um, based on these areas. So we could rank you with an 80, we could rank you with an 85, but basically anyone who has an 85 or above, a level three or above, gets the first rank. Um, from there, it's a lottery. So once you meet the criteria, then we're, the DOE will pick your name out of a DOE hat, um, which is a computer, I think. Um, but we're just gonna put the ones. And uh, for our special education program, the last thing, we do have a special education program here. Um, Doug can talk to you more about as well. He supervises that program. But we have two ICT classes on each grade. Um, so about 20 seats each year are for students with IEPs. We use the same rubric, um, but they're not competing against our general education students. So it's a smaller pool of students. Um, so generally, we have more flexibility in our special education. Um, range and we know that that tends to be natural if you have a learning disability you may not have four fours okay so um, we'll take some questions now before we get you upstairs so anybody have any questions I'm getting more thorough as the tours go on so hopefully <laughs> yes sir a question about the diversity in admissions <laughs> so let's say you have a hundred seats available a hundred slots does that mean that this year 34 of those seats will go to the diversity in admissions uh, applicants? That's correct. So if we have 100 seats, and we have about 120 to 130 seats, just to give you a number, if we have 100 seats, 34 seats would be prioritized for students who meet our criteria that are free or reduced lunch. It actually reflects actually our current Baruch. That's what our school looks like now. So it kind of happened generically through the system anyway, um, but we want to make sure we're preserving seats for students. Yes? Does the District 2 priority um, still apply to ICT students? Does the District 2 priority still apply to ICT students? It applies in the same way. So first District 2, then Manhattan, then other. We have, again, historically we've moved out of District 2 for ICT because there's fewer students. Um, so we have in the past a few, like one or two or three. Yes? If they're taking living environment regions now, what do they do in that grade? So we're hoping that we can figure something out. We do have more students taking living environment in eighth grade right now, they're taking an online physical science course in ninth grade here. Um, and then they move into earth science because we only have like three or four students. But we're hoping we can get them into a 10th grade class. It's a little challenging in a small school. Yes. Uh, the advisory program, that was the same advisor for all four years and about how many? The advisory program is about 20 kids, 25, and it's the same advisor for all four years. If the teacher leaves, the students tend to stay together and we'll get a new advisor. <laughs> How many students are, so again, that's good. Mm -hmm. So basically we're going to fill um, 130 seats, so we usually, they'll match, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but a lot more will get offers because we have students that will go to specialized or choose not to come, so it kind of gets back to 130. So it's a bit of a, a game. So we offer, I don't remember the exact number, let's say 160 seats get offered. So I don't know with the group one, it's the first year we're doing this. In the past, we just kind of went down in a row. Um, but Right. 
Yeah, so again, I can't really answer the technicalities. I can only answer what we're going to do on our end. So, yeah, that happens on the back end. I know there's wait lists this year and all that. It's all new for us as well. So basically, it really just, if you meet our criteria, I would say if you meet our criteria and you're thinking of what schools to put down, if you like Baruch, um, the other thing I'll say is that your, your ranking choice doesn't matter. Um, we don't see how you rank us, but the, the Office of Admissions is working very closely with us and they've told us, they, they promise, they swear again and again that they're looking at each applicant individually. So let's say we ranked Doug and they pull his name, and then but Doug put Baruch fourth. Um, we didn't know that. First, they're gonna look at what he put first, and if that school also selected him, he's going to that school. If not, it goes down. So even though we're a lottery, once that name is picked, you don't have to put us first to get selected from the lottery, if that makes sense. So you should rank the schools in your true order that you would like um, as much as possible. Yes? Sure, yeah. So the question was like, why did we move to the lottery and do we think that'll impact our school? So we moved to the lottery because we're a school that says we can serve students with 85s and above and historically we have and had the same reputation. Um, but as the system has become more competitive, we found that if you look in the directory, it will say, I think it's like 95 or 96 says is the grade that comes to Baruch because we weren't moving below. So we had students who met our criteria but we were just never getting there because literally it was like a tenth of a point separating students. So we felt that the lottery would give more opportunity for a broader range of students. One of the things our teachers talked about is really having a range of students is better in terms of instruction um, because we can have heterogeneous groupings. The students can learn and move each other more and they're finding when we have kind of two opposite ends, it's become more challenging in the classroom. So we think it'll strengthen our instruction. Um, we're not changing, like the courses that Doug reviewed with the APs, that is not changing. The plan is to stay the same. Um, we really feel it's, and it'll provide our students with the needed um, diversity of learning within a screen. I mean, we're still screened. Um, and I forgot your other half of your question, so. Okay, all right, we'll take one more question and then we do wanna get you upstairs because we have another group coming. Oh, sir, yes. Um, do you have any free periods during the day? Do we have free periods? Uh, when you're a junior, yes. Uh, once you're a junior, a little bit here and there, if you finish Spanish, that kind of thing. As a ninth grade, you'll have two study halls, but that's with a teacher. They're like a silent work period. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're here if you have an individual question for either of us. So again, there are two staircases. The one on the right can take you up, but it does not exit the building. You have to come back to the second floor and go out the main staircase.